called the SLR number two for chapter 15, the components of birth and how they affect labor. So I'm gonna talk about, first of all, the powers. So the powers relate to the contractions. So how often is this patient having contractions? Are they strong enough to make the cervix change? Um, are they too often, or having contractions too often and causing hyperstimulation? which can affect labor by causing perfusion problems to baby, causing decelerations in the heart rate. Um, in the long run, if we can't get that fixed, that patient might have to have a C-section, so that's how it can affect labor. Um, how well is mom pushing? Is mom tired and she can't push very effectively? Um, can she not feel because she has an epidural and that makes it more difficult to push? Or is she a really good pusher? Is that baby coming down real, real easily? So the contractions push, but mom's pushing efforts do help bring the baby down into the pelvis and get it delivered. The second P is the passage. So is the pelvis adequate to deliver the baby? So there are four types of pelvises. Um, we have gynecoid, we have anthropoid, we have android, and we have catapoid. These four types of pelvises um, one of them is the best. So the best one to have is gynecoid, like a gynecologist, gynecoid. Um, it is nice and round in its shape, making it easy to deliver a round head um, through it. The other one that's um, favorable for delivery is anthropoid. So anthropoid is more round in its shape also. If you look at platypoid, it's very flat. Um, and if you look at android, it's kind of heart-shaped, making it really peaked where the pubic bone is. Both of these are very difficult, if not impossible, to deliver through. So assessing the patient's pelvis is done by the physician. Uh, most of the time we know um, that either they have a favorable uh, pelvis or not. Um, what happens is if the passage is not adequate, it does affect the mechanisms of labor or those cardinal movements. Um, the baby has to make to get through the pelvis. So descent, can the baby descend into the size of the pelvis it is? So is the baby's head too big to go into mom's pelvis or is it gonna fit through there? After the baby descends, they engage. That means that the baby is even with mom's ischial spine. So let me grab my pelvis. So the ischial spines are these prominences here um, and what we're looking for is, is baby's head at the level of those ischial spines? That's engagement. So if the pelvis isn't big enough or baby's head is too big to come through the pelvis, it cannot engage. And so you would have failure of engagement or failure of descent. And sometimes that's a reason for a C-section. If the baby can't flex its head properly coming through that pelvis, so if it can't tuck its head like it should to get through the pelvis and to make the smallest part go through the pelvis the easiest, then that can mess up the mechanisms of labor. It has to internally rotate and get into a position that makes it easy for it to pass through the pelvis. If um, it gets through there, it can extend its head through the pelvis. So as it's passing through the pelvis, that head can extend to get out it can then turn the head, so extend the head, and then external rotation of the head. That aligns the shoulders to come out more easily, and it aligns it so that the shoulder, the front shoulder, and the back shoulder come through at this angle. Then the baby is expelled or expulsed from the contraction happening, and the baby comes through and is expulsed through the vagina and delivers vaginally. If any of these get interrupted, it can cause the patient to have to have a C-section. So like I said, failure to descend is one of the reasons. Um, and sometimes flexion can be a problem. So if baby's head is flexed and it's got the widest part exposed, sometimes it can't come through the pelvis because of the way the head is flexed. So that would be more of a passenger problem. And we're gonna talk about that now. So the passenger is the baby, right? So the baby um, has a number of things that have to align to make it deliver um, more easily. One of them is the lie. So we've got to assess how's the, how is baby laying in mom. 
Is it longitudinal or is it transverse? So those are the two lies that we see. Um, so longitudinal goes along with mom's spine. Transverse is the opposite. It goes against mom's spine. So it's the opposite direction of what mom's spine is. So we want our babies to be longitudinally, um, lying longitudinally to come out. The next thing is their attitude. Like we said, either their neck is flexed to help them come through, so it's tucked, or it's extended. So if a baby's head is extended, the widest part then is exposed and makes it really hard for it to come through the pelvis. So we want our babies to be flexed to come through the pelvis. The next thing is presentation. So presentation is, is the head presenting, that's called vertex. Is the bottom presenting, which would be um, the sacrum is presenting, or is the mentum presenting? So remember how we talked about if the face was flexed? That could be what we call a brow presentation. So this part of the baby is presenting. That's called the mentum. Um, sometimes it's the chin that's presenting. So you see that you feel the chin first or see the chin first. And that would be also mentum um, in its presentation. The next thing is station. Has the baby gotten its head into position, has it come through, and is it even with those ischial spines like we were talking about before? Is it even with this? The bottom of the head, is it even with the ischial spine? That would be zero station, that's engagement. Um, we want it to come to the plus side, so we want it to come down plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and then baby delivers. So the more it is in the plus, the better it is for delivery, the more optimal it is for delivery. So when you're doing a vaginal exam and we see all the ischial spines, the part for station is measured either in negative or positive numbers or at zero station if it's in line with the ischial spine. Um, if a baby is high, if a baby is in the negative numbers, negative two, minus two, um, and the patient is completely dilated, that may indicate that there's a problem with the pelvis being adequate, or it might be that the baby's just in a weird position and we can't get the baby to engage properly to come down into that pelvis. Um, so station is really important when we're talking about our passenger. Position is the last thing. So is the baby in a position that makes it easier for it to come out? So optimally, our baby would be in a occipit anterior position. So when we're looking at position, we have three letters that we're looking at. We're either looking at is the baby, um, is the back of baby's head presenting towards mom's um, left or right side? Is the baby facing anterior, is the back of that head facing towards mom's front side? Or is the back of the head presenting posterior, which is mom's back side? Or is this baby facing the side, which would be transverse? The last thing we look at is, um, is it the occiput, the head, that's presenting? Is it the sacrum that's presenting? Or is it the um, mentum, like we talked about a couple minutes ago? So when we talk about position, we're talking about our baby's position coming out. So I want you guys to know um, all these different positions, but we're going to talk about LOA and um, hopefully this will help clarify a little bit what position it is. So if I'm putting the patient in a, or the baby in a left occipit anterior position, I've got to look at mom's left side. So this is mom's left side. And is the baby's head, the occipit, presenting towards the anterior, towards mom's front side? So this is to the left, and this is the occiput, the back of the head, and this is more anterior. If the baby was completely sideways, this would be left occiput transverse because the head is facing totally towards mom's side. If the baby turned a little bit backwards, now the back of baby's head is presenting to the left side still, but it's presenting to mom's posterior side. So sometimes a baby will present completely occiput anterior and you don't have it left or right, you simply have occiput anterior. This is the most optimal position to deliver a baby. 
Posterior babies, so babies that are occipit posterior, facing towards mom's back. If you think about it, the back of the head is in line with mom's spine. Mom has a lot of back labor, and the other thing that happens in labor is the contractions are not able to efficiently squeeze around that baby because of the position that they're in. It, um, to get that baby to turn, our nursing intervention would be to position our patient on their hands and knees or bending over top of a desk or a table so that the um, help of gravity will turn that baby into a more anterior position making it a little easier for them to deliver. If we had a baby that was in a sacral position, so if we had a baby that was presenting in left sacrum anterior, this baby, would, its bottom would be presenting, it's in a breech position. So the presentation for that baby would be breech, but the position is left, towards mom's left, sacrum and it's more towards the anterior. So when we're feeling this is during a vaginal exam. So the physician or the nurse checking the patient would determine what position this baby is in. The importance is at delivery. So when we are documenting our delivery, we document what position the baby was in. So if this baby delivered breech, which typically they deliver by section, but if it delivered by breech, we would document this as left sacrum anterior because the sacrum is pointing towards mom's left front side. Um, if a baby is transverse, it would be either left transverse or right transverse. Um, so if you see um, uh, LOT or ROT, let's do ROT. So this is mom's right side the occipit is presenting, and it is transverse. It is completely to mom's side. I'm hoping that this will help clarify position. Position seems to be one of the things that's pretty confusing. Um, just remember that when you're looking at the patient, you're looking at their left and right side. That's the piece that's usually the most confusing out of all of this. Um, we need to also take into account the patient's psyche. So it's important to make sure that our patients, um, if we can do the, our best to decrease anxiety and fear, a lot of that's done through explanation or education of our patients, what to expect, what are the stages of labor, where you're at, what are your options for comfort. Um, do we do non-pharmacological comfort versus an epidural or pain medication, pharmacological? Um, the reason we care about this is because catecholamines are released when a patient is um, anxious or fearful. And that, what those catecholamines do are they inhibit contractions and they also decrease placental blood flow. So we can cause problems with not having enough contractions because we have catecholamines that are blocking our contractions. Um, or we could have decrease in placental blood flow, causing problems with perfusion for baby, causing decelerations in the heart rate. So you can see how that could affect our labor. It could slow it down or it could cause us to have to have a C-section because our baby's blood flow is cut down and it's causing problems with the, our placental blood flow. The other thing we need to take into account is fatigue. Is mom really tired? Can she not push? Can she not use these towers over here because she's exhausted? Maybe she needs a little rest time if that's a possibility. Um, is she from a different culture? So culture definitely fill, fits into the psyche, so how people are thinking may be based off of their culture. And so certain cultures are very vocal. Hispanics tend to be very vocal, um, or Latin American Hispanics are all vocal during their labor. Um, our, Asian culture tend to be a little bit more quiet and stoic during their pregnancies, during their labor, um, and so you may not hear as much out of them. So just because their culture is a little bit different, we want to make sure that we're taking into account and not ignoring um, those things that could cause differences like pain assessment wise for our patient. You know, maybe we don't think our patient's in a lot of pain because they're stoic and actually they're in a lot of pain and need some pain relief. Um, during their labor. So it could affect their labor if they're hurting and they can't, um, they're fearful because of that.